Hey, Kim, how are you doing? Good, how are you? All right, so we know you're the uh, property management guru, so we're going to yeah. talk to you about that a little bit today. Um, so I guess just general, how long have you been in real estate? I've been real estate since 2004. And I've been, I started managing properties in right after 2008 when the market crashed. Uh, some of my clients couldn't sell. So that's how I started my first home is they couldn't sell their house. So we rented it out. Okay. So you've gotten the full swing of real estate over the years on both sides. <laughs> yeah, both sides. I, I kept myself out though. I don't ever get over about 25 properties and I, I really prefer staying around 20. Yeah. Um, just so, cause I, I do need time to do my resale business. So I yeah. try to keep a balance. That makes sense. All right. So yeah, most people have a negative impact when it comes to proper a negative outlook when it comes to property management and mm -hmm. dealing with all of that. So you said you like to keep your property at around 20. <laughs> Is that what you feel makes it more manageable to, uh, to where you're not overwhelmed or? Mm -hmm. Well, if you, you, well, kind of both with property management, it's if you're going to do a good job, in my opinion, it, it's it's time consuming because, you know, there's more lawsuits in property management than there are in resale. So you really have to dot your I's, cross your T's. And so the, the key with the property management, I think, is you always have to fall back on the lease and fall back on the management agreement. So it's much more of this is exactly what it says. We're in resale. You can kind of stick in something, cross out something, or at least in Virginia, you can, you know, kind of alter the contract a bit in the terms. Property management, really, you can't. It's a non-term. It's this is it. We can't change. So I think just to, for me to do a good job and to inspections and, and, and keep up with the tenants and call them and, you know, say, how, how did that repair go and that kind of thing, um, you know, 20 was about all I could do. Um, so how, did you, how did you originally get into uh, property management and real estate in general? Well, in real estate, I got in because we, I, um, my ex-husband and I, he was a, he managed commissary. So we had spent five and a half years in Europe. And, uh, and I, I did work over there. I did I work for Army Community Service. I did some teaching on how to live on the economy and how to make budget actually was one of them. And and also did I worked for the National Health Care System in England, which was very interesting. Um, just a little part time job. But it was I, I still kind of got to see it was a very small hospital. So I kind of got to see how the national health care system works. And then so we got back to Texas. I got a great job um, writing grants, state and federal grants. And that was really fun because our last grant was the, was well over about two, two million. I can't remember the exact number right now. Um, so it was under George Bush. So it was at the, putting curriculum in schools based on the five risky behaviors. So I we had educators and we put curriculum in schools. And when I moved here, I got, I, I looked for some jobs and I got a little frustrated about some of the jobs that I was, I was being offered, wasn't from here, didn't know anybody. Um, my husband didn't like to take off. My kids were starting all over in a new school. So I thought, well, maybe I liked our real estate agent. He was actually from Rosenwamble. And, and I thought, well, maybe I can sell houses. So I got my real estate um, license and started out. And I was really going to go with my neighbor across the street owned, owned a company, a commercial company called Global at the time. And uh, he, I was going to go to work for him. But then I decided to go to work and do resale and kind of get to know it because he didn't have the time to train me. And I definitely wanted somebody who had time to, you know, train me a little bit. So that's how it all got started. You got into property management, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, like right around the time where uh, the crash happened. So, Correct. Yep. Oh, yep. I got in property management right when it crashed. And so when I came into real estate, it was like this market. So it was like, wow, anybody can sell houses because we we had a lot of uh, we had more inventory back then. So we could you know, we still had to bid over and no inspections. But eventually, you know, you could get somebody a house. Um, not like right now where it's a little bit harder. Our inventory is so low. So after when the market crashed. 
um, which was a weird day because it was almost like the water turned off. I remember we were in the office and talking about, wow, the phones aren't ringing as much. And yeah, I had a listing and not getting calls. And it was like, bam, it, it just, it just stopped. And so, you know, it kept getting worse and we went through the foreclosures. So that's how I got into it because one of my clients didn't want to accept what they could get for their house. And I, that was my first one. And then it just kind of snowballed from there. Would you say, so most of the properties that you manage, do most of them get into the rental situation because they can't sell their house? Or is it a lot of people looking to have that income property? You know what? I, I think for me, it's kind of, half and half. And now I'm seeing some of the people that bought rental properties during the height are going to put their houses on the market because they just don't want to be landlords or they're so far away now they feel like they're they're not close enough. So to me, it's half and half. And there's a big difference between an owner who has to be a, a, you know, has to be a, a landlord and ones who do it for the benefit of being a landlord. So, it you know, it's a different mindset. Um, it's the ones that the ones that are in it because they want the tax write off. They want to build their portfolio of rental properties. You know, their mindset is they understand that you have to keep up with the property. They understand that it, at the end of the day, it is still your property. Um, the ones that are kind of forced into it, you know, they usually don't like being a landlord. So anytime something's wrong, they have hard feelings and, you know, they just didn't really want to be a landlord. So it's kind of half and half right now, but I'm slowly weeding it out. I don't have as many of those properties left that the people were forced into being landlords. Most of mine right now, they're, they're all there because they want the benefit of being a landlord. So what were some of the issues just starting out uh, being a property manager slash like landlord? What were some of the issues you came across or something that if you had to go back, you would have done a lot? Of- well, I think it was learning to stand up. Um, to tenants when, when you notice something wrong, because, um, you know, a lot of people don't tell you the truth. And so it's, it's really hard sometimes when you're arguing over something like a dirty air conditioner filter, or, you know, how did that really get, you know, how did that AC line get stepped on? It looks like someone stepped on it. Oh no, no one stepped on it. You know, that's the hardest thing I think is the, is the dealing directly with the people when the issues come up. Most people, I believe, are good and they, you know, and they're they're fair about it. But when it's if they've broken something large or they like not changing the air AC, AC filters and the air conditioner has gone out and you can tell that the coils are all clogged, you know, that, that that's hard. I mean, and when you have a tenant that is, you know, lower end tenant that's only not lower end, but you know, what I mean, you know, the cheaper rents, when you, all you can afford is nine hundred dollars a month rent, which right now you can't hardly even get anything for 900. You don't have the money to do some of the repairs that some of our leases and our landlords expect you to do. And and the other thing I get tickled at is, you know, we ask tenants to do small repairs, but I always tell them, if you don't have the skill, please don't do it because it it just makes it worse. I've had people try to fix or small things on toilets and stuff. And, you know, then the water was running constantly. So the rule is, you know, I don't care what it is. Be honest with me. If you can't fix it, let me know and I'll get you help. So the hardest thing I think is bucking up and um, you kind of have to take your emotions out of it. You have to remember that I work for the owner and stay with the lease. And if you if you can always go back to the lease with the tenants, it makes it a lot easier. So what are some systems, like I know like right now it's like a growing trend. Everyone wants to be like they manage the properties themselves through like all these apps and everything. Like we manage mm-hmm. ours right now ourselves through a company called Avail. But what are some of the systems like people who wanted to manage themselves to put in place to kind of help prevent some of the things that could go wrong in uh, being a property manager? All right. Well, I think that, you know, the first thing is you need to make sure you can, you know, you look at their credit score and there's also all kinds of services online you can get where they can run your credit score online. And what we look at the most is mostly the judgments. You know, if you've got some problems with medical bills and stuff like that, we can kind of forgive that, even though it does affect your credit score or your debt to income a little bit. 
we can kind of oversee that. But if they have a lot of outstanding judgments, I think I would be a little bit away, uh, you know, I would be a little bit leery. Um, I also think that, you know, a good rental reference, why did they leave the last place that they were renting? Um, and, and then the debt to income, you know, you really want their debt to income to be 45% or less. That's just, so you add the, what their rent's going to be plus all their debt. And then you, you know, calculate it that way. So that, that's what I think is the best thing to think of. And I always think that the person, the people who promise you the most will give you the least. So if they, if they talk to you and keep going on and on about what they're going to do, it's like, I always think, "Uh uh-huh. So you kind of have to just learn how to, to read people. Um, But with, you know, with all the laws today, when you go through a real estate agent, we can't really do that. Like we don't, you know, I don't even like to meet the people that are applying for my properties because then it's a very, it's a non-biased judgment on, who just is the most qualified tenant. And I think that's very important in, in today where if you manage it yourself and you, if you own less than five properties, you can just kind of choose your tenants, you know, who you like, if you own five or more, then you have to get into, you have to accept section eight. You have to make sure you go by all the laws and it becomes a little bit more complicated. So there's some benefits to managing it yourself. So, um, just to go back to what you said when you said screening tenants. So someone who just, let's say, just bought the house, they want to be able to uh, manage it themselves. How do they go about getting that information or how do they get to where they can screen screen people or look up their debts? Uh, debt debt? There's, there's some great online services out there that you can join and they will do, um, they'll run pro, um, credit scores for you. So you can do that. And now some of them, then they'll have, you'll have to do all the calling yourself, call to verify that they work here. You have to, you want to ask for pay stubs or bank statements, um, that kind of thing. And you'll have to call the, whoever their landlord was before. You could make up your own form. There's some great websites out there that offer forms and leases and that type of thing for them. So what are some of the systems that you put in place? Like, let's say you get the ideal tenant and everything like that. How do you, because they always say, like, no one's going to treat a property like, like, like you would treat your property. So what's some systems you put in place that more or less can help prevent, like, tenants from, like, trashing a place or anything right. like that? Or... Well, it's, first of all, you need to hand the property over exactly the way you want it back. And I mean like clean windows, clean window sills. You need to you need to go in there and clean baseboards. You know, have your AC serviced and clean. You need to. I mean, you need to have all the. Um, for one thing that people always skip is cleaning out the light fixtures. You know, you need to have that property just spotless, top to bottom. The garage swept out. It, you know, don't leave old bottles of. You know. Uh, weed killer or fertilizer. I mean, I mean, clear that property out because if you start leaving things in properties, um, like a lot of people want to do, or tenants will want to do that. Well, the next tenant might use that. Well, the next tenant might want to use that, but you need to, they need to buy their own and it needs to go because then you just start accumulating all this extra stuff. So the number one rule is you, you get it exactly the way you want it you know, remote controls. Then you do the inventory and take a million pictures. I mean, take pictures of door jams, toilets, toilets, the lids open, the lids shut. I mean, underneath all the sinks. I mean, you need to take a million pictures um, to before you hand that property over and then do a walkthrough with your tenant within the property and talk to them about what they need to do you know, this is the G. If you know the GFIs are in the circuit breaker, you know, let them know everything about the house um, before that when you walk them through it, so they'll know what you expect. Um, pull down the, give them the the sizes of the AC filters. Some people even give a year's supply and date them, but I've found them in the trash cans, so that doesn't always work. But it's a, it is a way that you can, you know, label your filters. But I think that's the most important thing when you're managing yourself is hand it over exactly the way you want it. Have the house totally, completely clean, clear, and do a walkthrough with those tenants 
prior to um, to handing it over. And then the other thing is establish what is an emergency and what is not an emergency. You know, um, it's weird the way the laws are because heat is an emergency, AC is not. Um, Water is an emergency, no hot water is not. So you need to establish with your tenants when you want phone calls on the weekends and in the middle of the night and when you don't and really set some guidelines and okay, look, you need to call me about things during normal working hours unless these things occur, because then you're going to, you're going to have, if you get a tenant that tends to be a little bit, I don't, I want to say whiny or, you know, they tend to <laughs> notice everything, then you're going to get a lot of phone calls, you know, when you don't want phone calls. So, <laughs> Yeah. So you just have to establish some boundaries, I think, with them and and put that in policy. You know, write your own policies up and tell them what you expect from the lawn. You can't make a tenant do anything that's biodegradable. So they you can't make a mulch. You can make them keep weeds away, but you can't make a mulch, can't make, make them power wash. You know, anything that comes back because of the environment or disintegrates because of the environment, you can't. So you just need to be very clear in your lease and in your policies of what you want those tenants to do. So once you get the lease up, is there things that you do to, uh, to like throughout the year, let's see, you have a one-year lease. Do you like, do you like Popeyes or or do you like, do like where they have to send like pictures or anything like that? How does that explain? Yeah, I do. Well, we're... Like with with Rose and Womble, we're required to do, we're supposed to do three pop buys or drive buys a year and then one yearly inspection. Um, now, COVID has messed this up. So even the city is is kind of messed up behind, I mean, it's kind of behind on their occupancy or yearly inspections that are every four years. So right now, but when you do the interior inspection, you know, that's, that's another thing that when I was first got into it, you were a little bit leery to open all the curtains and open the windows and, you know, because all their stuff was in there and their kids. But you really should do that because a lot of times if they've got a broken windowsill or, you know, they can make it not look broken and things like that. So you, you do need to do a real thorough yearly inspection. And then if there are repairs that the tenant needs to do, of course, you would charge them. But also you, the landlord themselves should go ahead and fix those. Because what happens is they tend to let it kind of, it, it, it's kind of like sight unseen. You know, you, you know, you don't see it, so you don't really remember about it. So it's really good to go ahead and fix those every year because otherwise you'll kind of forget about them. And then the problems just uh, keep on rolling. So, yeah, yearly inspection, two or three drive-bys. And then like with mine, if I drive by and that something's wrong, I'll send them a little text message, you know, just asking. And then I'll pop that by there. And then if there's maintenance to be done throughout the year, you know, you can meet your contractor over there and always make sure you're the one that lets them in. So do you have like, I guess there's Popeyes and there's uh, like stuff all into your original lease, like all that's built in or say that? Oh, yeah, it's okay. built in the management agreement and then you tell the tenants. Mm-hmm, that so if I was like, if we were managing ourselves, we would basically say like, hey, we're going to have like in the lease, it would say, um, we're going to do a certain amount of Popeyes. We're going to do um, a yearly inspection. And stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I have a unique uh, question because so we have a pool right now. And if we were trying to rent it out, the pools are have a lot of maintenance and everything like that. So how would we be able to make sure like it doesn't like keep overflowing and stuff like that? Do you just put that into lease? Like, hey, you got to. Yeah, we have a. I would make your if you have a pool or say you had a, I know anything extra and additional in your home, I would do a separate addendum. So you would have a pool addendum and then you would set, then you're going to label out exactly what you expect those tenants to do with the pool. And if that's, um, you know, they're, they're, they're required to buy the salt, put the salt in or, you know, close the pool, open the pool that needs to be put in that, in that pool addendum. And a lot of landlord, a lot of owners though will pay to have it opened and closed. What about, um, like, would you do, like, I guess, like, quarterly inspections to make sure that everything's taken care of, or do you just... For the pool? Yeah. Um, well, if you usually, when you have a the guy who opens and shuts it, he can kind of tell you what's 
going on when he opens it and what it looked like. Um, but the tenants will usually, you know, call you, but you could go over there and look to see what you thought, you know, during that time. What about like draining a pool? Like you have to tell them draining like, it? Yeah, because like a lot of times when like the pool level rises, you can get seat um, behind the liner and right. across a bunch of issues. Like, how would you prevent that? You just have like have that in the lease agreement that you gotta make sure that you drain down the pool and stuff like that. Well, usually I would I would probably recommend somebody having that done and not making that the responsibility of the tenant Absolutely. because you have to even you know. Even though there there are wonderful tenants out there, and I've I have I've been very blessed on the wonderful people I've rented to, you know, at the end of the day, that's still yours, and mm -hmm. in the back of their mind, that's still not theirs. Yeah, I don't know, and it's not because they're bad people; it's just because that's just the way you are when you're a tenant. You have the mentality that you know really, the landlord is responsible for some things, and that's probably one of them. That I would do. And I also tell my my owners that, you know, make your landscaping as simple as possible, because um, when you have these very intricate landscapes, you know, it doesn't usually look the same when when you get back, you know, if you've moved away and come back or whatever, because, you know, some people just aren't yard people but they're good on the inside. Then you have some that are good on the outside and not on the end, but it's very, it's much better to just to go ahead and, you know, make that landscape as simple as possible. So they can, it's easier for them to take care of or get a land, you know, hire somebody, especially if you have a lot of bushes, I would suggest hiring somebody to come out and cut and trim those bushes, you know, every year just on you. It would it would make a better tenant, and it would also help you out as far as keeping your property up. Um, I guess yeah. the, the one thing everyone's scared about, well, even being a landlord or even myself, is like having to ev evict someone. So how does that process work? It's like, like after like, let's say they stop paying or something like that, how does that work? To do they get a turn on grace period, or how does that work? Well, you first of all, you need to address it really quickly. Do not, mm -hmm. you know, the, the tenant, if you have tenants, say, oh, well, I'll give you 800 this day and 800 that day. And so you keep kind of taking money here and there and piecemealing it together. Stop that right away. You know, um, just tell them, no, the whole rent's due. So then you go to court. Say the fifth day usually is, or the sixth day is usually when rents are late. And if you put a notice, I suggest one on the front door, emailed and then mailed. And then you and then, you know, if they pay then your late fee. That's fine. If not, by about the 15th of the month, you can go up to the court and ask for a writ of possession because your tenants haven't paid rent. And then they'll set a court date and then, you'll, you know, so they'll get a court date if they do come to court then they're automatically going to get two more weeks or maybe they've paid before they came to court, whatever. If they don't come to court, you can get possession immediately. So then you go back to the sheriff's department and you arrange for them to accompany you to the property with a locksmith um, to get them out of the property. So how you know, late so would be considered late? Is that you're saying like once like the day of the month, this you says five days afterwards? Like, that Five days after you, usually in your lease, you should have a day that, you know, the dead date that they're going to, they can pay without a, a penalty. So after that, you know, usually you call them, but if they haven't paid, then you can technically, they, if you've given them notice that they need to pay rent, they could, be, you could go to court by the 15th of the month and file for writ of possession. Now, some people do let it go on maybe to the next month you know, call them and, and, you know, I can reasonably so, um, but you, but you can do it that quickly. Yes. But if they go to court and the tenants are there and they're proven hardship and that kind of thing, you know, the judge might give them longer kind of depends on the situation. Yeah. So, um, so would there be any other circumstance other than, um, I know, like, let's say, obviously, if they don't pay, like, what happens if they, like, trash the place or anything? Yeah. 
Well, the, I've uh, in, in the years that I've been doing this since 08, I've only had to do two evictions. And it was very sad. One lady had lost her job, but we had just really worked with her to a point of, you know, the landlords needed money. So we had to evict her and she didn't leave. So we, I, the sheriff did come over there and we had to watch her move out. But, um, you know, it's sad. They do leave things behind and you pretty, the landlord pretty much, you know, picks that up. When in what people don't realize is when so at the end of the day, when you've you filed on people and they still they go away and they owe you money. So you put it into collections and most people use a, you know, a, a um, formal or professional collection agency. That collection agency gets about 45 percent of whatever is collected. Mm-hmm. So you never really get, you know, 100 percent of your property back. And when and sometimes you'll just get. $100 here, $100 there for a long time till it's paid. And that usually comes when they get a new job, uh, when they, after taxes uh, and inheritance. So they just kind of keep tracking them and then we'll garnish their, their wages. So that's kind of how that works. But you do expect Clex agencies to get about 45%. So let's say like, I've always heard, and I could be wrong. So like, let's say you did evict someone the very day you bring the sheriff there. I heard that if they say like, oh, they, they just filed for bankruptcy and everything, that pushes them back for like a certain amount of days, doesn't it? When, they, they, when the tenants they, file bankruptcy? Yeah, let's say the tenants filed for bankruptcy or anything like that, or it might be foreclosures, maybe, I don't know. But um, I, just, I, I just heard like like once they, like, let's for instance, like you said to go change the keys and say they're mm-hmm. there, what they say, like, here's my paper to just file for bankruptcy. Can't that delay it or... I haven't had that delayed. Now I've had that delayed on short sales and um, on short sales when I've tried to sell short sales, but I've never had that delayed on a, on a rental property because they, it doesn't matter if they file bankruptcy, you know, they don't own the property, but now they could go when, when that initial court date comes up and the tenants have to show up for non-payment of rent. Now they could claim it there to the judge and he might give them longer to vacate. But the one thing I do suggest, um, and the sheriff told me this, we unfortunately had to evict somebody and the family didn't know. So the sheriff and the locksmith could only go there early that morning. So we were there by, I'd say, nine o'clock and they were all in bed. And uh, he was the per- the the gentleman that was on, the main provider wasn't there. And they all came to the door in their pajamas you know, with us saying they had to be out. Well, you know, that they had a house full of stuff. And so I did say, okay, I'm going to give you 48 hours. And then I brought the sheriff and the locksmith back in, in 48 hours. Um, but, but, you know, it's kind of up to the person that's handling that, what you'd want to do. But I, I just think that they were truly shocked. So, um, you know, and for them not to be out. That wasn't and fair. So yeah. I, I even sat there and helped them. I yeah. even sat there and called around people who would help them out because I felt, you know, I I, I can't help it. My heart goes out to those people. Yeah. I imagine. So, but it, I understood that why they needed to go, but still, there's still people and we don't know their circumstances. So I extended it. So that that's what I suggest is, you know, but most people are good, and I think, but you do have to give the key is proper written notices and anything dealing with property management with your tenants. Makes sense. Yeah. So, I was, I was going to ask your most difficult rental situation, but that sounds like that's my most probably it. Most <laughs> well, you know what? I'll tell you that the most. <laughs> The funniest, I've had some funny stories in property management that will sure that will, I could write a book, but one of the ones that was a little bit funny was um, I would gone to a paint night with a friend. So she and I were sitting there, you know, waiting for paint night. And, and, and so I got a phone call from my tenant, my owners, and they said, what, what's going on in our house? And I said, I don't know. You know, did you get a complaint? And they said, look at the news. And the gentleman, <laughs> the gentleman that lived there had committed a crime and the little bomb robot was going in through their house and up the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I, 
I was just shocked. It was on the evening news anyway. So that was, that's quite shocking. So, <laughs> that'd be crazy. Yeah. So anyway, I started, you know, and so then you have to deal with, then there was damage because of the people breaking into the house, um, yeah. not knowing um, what they were going to find. So that, that's something else to, to deal with too. But yeah, that's, that was difficult. Yeah. Yeah. And then embarrassing, but I never, you know, would have guessed that. What's going on? So I'm looking on the news right now. <laughs> yeah, they, they saw the news before I did. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. But it, and then the other difficult tenants are the ones that you, um, you keep giving leniency to and, yeah. and, you know, taking partial payments and, and you get caught up in that. And, you know, the owners have the right to do that. You ask their permission. But that's hard because when you do finally have to put your foot down, it's it's really hard. And uh, I would suggest to anybody that rents that don't ever, you know, cash money. They need a receipt. Everything needs to be signed. Anything that you take from the tenant needs to be documented as far as partial payment or payment for this. Um, just really make sure you keep good records. Um. And because of COVID, uh, were were they not like people not allowed to evict people? Because I know they right. said something about foreclosures and evictions ends like the end of this uh, end of June. Mm -hmm. So yeah, like how does that how did that work? Just be like, oh well, you more or less with your arms tied, you can't do anything. You just yeah, your arms are tied. But the government was offering assistance to to tenants and to landlords. There were, so there were some grants out there for the landlords who weren't getting paid their rent. Now, I don't know if they had to prove a lot of hardship because I didn't pray, you know, thank the Lord. I did not have any of my tenants have an issue. None of my landlords had that issue. So I didn't have to go through that process, but there, so I'm not sure if the ten, the landlords had to prove hardship, but there were some grants out there for both parties that would help them out a little bit. And the other thing that way behind is, you know, whenever you have a rental property here, most of the time they need to have an inspection from the city and you can yeah. actually get fined if you don't have that and inspection is good for four years. Well, there, you know, we, we couldn't do any of our inspections, including our yearly inspections. We couldn't go in the house, but Zoom helped us out on that a little bit. But so the, the city is still only doing drive-by inspections, but they are back to doing their inspections. So, and if that doesn't apply to just real estate agents who manage properties, that's anybody who has a rental property in these cities, um, inspections are required. So you really do need to call and make if see if you're in an area that requires a rental inspection. And it's only for our benefit because it keeps people from being slumlords and making sure the properties are in rental in you know in rent condition. It's a bit on the more like the buying side uh, now. So I know we work with a lot of investors. What are some of the things that you feel like that deter from different from other investors, like people that really know what they're doing, people are just getting started out? What are, um, what are the differences? What type of properties are they looking at? Or what do you feel like is the best investment, you being as a uh, landlord for as long as you have? Right. Well, you know, it kind of depends on it kind of depends on what kind of landlord you want to be. I had a, a young client that he was in the you know duplexes um, in, in Norfolk and but he wanted to work with Section 8. He was open to that. And so his he wanted things he could put some equity in and then he wanted, you know, um, about a 65 percent. So the rent would cover. So he would have, you know, I think he wanted like 20% for repairs. And then he, so he had a very strict rule about the debt, you know, what he could get for rent compared to monthly payment and what he wanted in that. Um, other investors just want for the tax write off and thinking they're going to write it out. And it one day it's going to be a good investment and they'll have it paid off. But I still think location, location, location is key. And I think if you're the best is always going to be the three bedroom detached house. You know, those are the ones that really they don't stay on the market very long. Um, you have to watch out in condos, of course, because, you know, they'll they'll cap the amount of rental properties that are allowed in the condo and their fees keep going up. So you need to calculate that. And most people, you need to calculate those those condo fees into your rent. You know, the tenant doesn't pay them. You'd have to adjust your rent um, according. So you'd need to figure out what you wanted to do about that. Sure. And I, 
Okay. Mm-hmm. But the the but condos and and like in La Chateau, you know, Riverwalk, all those are are great little rentals, you know, because they're nice, they're in a good area, and that kind of thing. So it kind of depends on what you're looking for. So back to what you said about Section Eight. So how does like people go about like let's say on uh, huge so or someone to contact if because that don't they have to pay? They're paying their half. So do you call the people who are ahead of Section Eight to say, hey, uh, mm-hmm. this person, so who do you call for that? Or yeah, there's there's certain numbers in each city, and it's ran through the city, and you call and say that you want to put your house. They'll come out and inspect your house, and then. Um, then you rent to a Section 8 client. And when you're calculating their debt to income um, or in their and what they make every month, you have to add in what they're going to get from the city. And most of the time, the city kind of calculates in utilities. Now, they're, they're, they're changing some of that right now, but a lot of times they'll calculate utilities. So you, you need to take that in mind, too. You can require that they pay over a little bit, you know, um, that they pay you something out of their pocket each month. In addition to that, a lot of people believe that's kind of a way to get them get a little bit more meat in the game. Yeah. So you can do that. But, and then the checks just come directly to your, you know, are mailed to you on a monthly basis. So it is a guaranteed um, income. When you screen section eight, do you also call or try to like make sure they have employment also? Or do you like, yeah, we have to, even though you're section eight, you still have to, qualify your credit score, your debt to income, rental references. Yep, you have to qualify just like everybody else. Oh, I got so um what about section eight uh like evictions or what does that I know like if they don't pay their half, do they lose their section eight? So how does that work? Well it, you know what I don't I've never really heard of a lot of section eight evictions unless they've just totally trashed out the house. Because they're you're getting money from the, you know, from the city, the or for probably from the state. So you probably would always get your rent. I think evictions there are probably more like damage to the property, or maybe they lost their Section Eight qualifications. But we, I've never really had any owners that I have that use sec, that use Section Eight. I've never had any of them have to evict. And tell you the truth. A lot of Section 8 renters are very good renters. They stay for a long time. Yeah. Once they get a nice property, they stay for a really long time. I just feel like a lot of times Section 8 almost has like a uh, negative, like, mm-hmm. yeah, bad rep, but a lot of times they're also really good people. And right. Well, you know what? I think it's the same way with anything. If your property is in a, you know, if you're going to go to the, the really – lower in rent areas, you probably are going to have a little bit more problems um, than you do if you're going to go to just a moderate kind of, you know, area where, you know, you're paying twelve, thirteen hundred dollars a month rent. So I kind of, I kind of just think it's really on the area too. You know, unfortunately, if you live in an area that, you know, is not the best, you don't always feel so good about yourself and your surroundings and you kind of just go with the flow. I think it kind of, kind of one of those, you know, clustering effects, you kind of just go in with the environment. Um, but yeah, section eight, it's not, they're, they're, they're often very nice. They have jobs They're trying to go to school. They just have come on some hard times. So I know you originally, like, I know we both deal with like the house market and everything's like uh People are paying over asking and stuff like that. But you told me the rental market is even worse. The rental market, they're like, it's way more competitive than the housing market is right now. Yeah, the rental market's tough right now. The last couple properties I've had on the market, we've had, oh, I cut one off at six applicants because they all looked pretty good. And the other, bam, I mean, within less than 24 hours, I think I had 11 on one and about 10 on the other one. And so we, you know, at that point, it's just crazy. People are renting properties sight unseen or they're just driving by them. You don't really have time to go out and look at them anymore. They rent so quickly. And then people are also bidding up rents. I've had that happen twice now. So how does that work? I've never like has to do when they're like, in their what? application or when they put amount of rent paid is one of the questions or the, the blanks, they put higher amount. Interesting. So, yeah, so they'll, and then what people don't know is, you know, we we have to present 
you know, the top couple to the owner because he has the final choice. But, you know, we don't tell them names. We don't tell them where they work. All we provide them is just with, you know, just the bare minimum qualifications. So he doesn't, you know, he can't make a biased decision or anything about it. Um, but then, of course, if you have one that offers you a lot more money rent, then, you know, that's that's pretty enticing. Yeah. You know, for people. It's true. It makes sense. Yeah. And, you know, if you if, if you're managing properties by yourself or you're out there and you don't your credit score is not very good, you know, you can pay a double deposit. That will work, too, sometimes to put down a double deposit, which would, you know, kind of ensures them that if something happens, they're still going to have, you know, the rent. You can't deposit, uh, do more than two months rent. Um, right. Deposits can only be twice the rent. And that includes pet deposits. So if you have you know, two or three pets and your, and your rent is $1,200 a month. Would you, you know, so you charge what, $900. So that would be what, 1700 deposit. Well, you couldn't go much more than that $300 more. So you have to include that. So, and that's the, that's a state of Virginia law. So do you, uh, like, like do you have to like allow uh, certain pets? Like I know, like, some pets are, they don't allow, and some they do. Like, how does that work? Yeah, the, well, the, a lot of them, and this is really because of the insurance companies don't allow the aggressive breeds, pit bulls, chows, uh, Dobermans, rock rollers, and there's Akitas is one of them. So that's more of a, to protect the owner because of their insurance. And even now, you know, people say, well, it's a pit lab mix and so it's kind of at the description of the owner i always want to see a picture of them and let the owner owner decide that um and then the the other thing is is you you know if you have an aggressive dog you've got to be really careful you know when you sending people in there to get work done or anybody over there so that you need i would suggest for everybody to meet Maybe even if you're managing yourself to meet the pet or have to see some pictures of it. But now if you have a service dog, you have to rent that person, no matter if you would allow pets or not. I got you. So have you ever had issues with pets? Because I've heard stories about dogs in apartments like uh, my my brother-in-law's dog ate through drywall and was a puppy. Right. <laughs> I don't know how you do that. Yeah. Yeah. You have to, you can charge the tenant and that if it, if you use up the pet deposit, then you go into the regular deposit. And then in the same thing, if a tenant leaves with all kinds of charges that his, his deposit won't cover, then, you know, and they, and they don't want to pay it, then you take them to court. And again, if it goes into collections, you only get about, you know, they, they will keep 45%. Yeah. I, I didn't know that the collections part that was definitely new to me. But uh, we're going to wrap this up, but I do really appreciate you doing this. Like, I've learned oh, yeah. a lot. Not that oh. I thought I knew kind of probably answer pretty well, but I, I've yeah. learned a lot of this. And I know a lot of people, this going to help a lot of people. So thank you. For- You're welcome. All right. Y'all have a good day. Thank you. You too.